By the late 1800s, small towns were popping up all around the USA. Along the Mississippi River, in Hannibal, Missouri, Lumber Baron John J. Crickshank Jr. set up his lumber manufacturing operation to easily supply the flourishing river towns with construction materials. By streamlining his business model and utilizing both the river and newly laid train tracks, he was able to send his lumber far and wide. This central location in the heartland made trading with small towns not only easy, but cheap. He was able to amass one of the largest fortunes in Missouri at the time, and set out to build his dream house. The site he chose was perched high on a cliff, overlooking the then-flourishing town of Hannibal with panoramic views of the Mississippi River Valley. He brought in skilled craftsmen from all around the country and hired the esteemed St. Louis-based architecture firm of Barnett, Haynes & Barnett to design for him his dream house. The firm had gained notoriety after completing one of the greatest basilicas to grace the Midwest, the St. Louis Basilica. Once their plans were finalized, he hired Louis Comfort Tiffany to design custom stained glass, then had exotic wood and stone brought up the Mississippi from every inhabited continent. Construction started in 1898, carrying on for two years, until the grand, Georgian-inspired estate was finished in 1900 for the grand total of $125,000, the modern-day equivalent of about $4.6 million. Though, this figure does not include the materials he was able to supply from his own company, and possibly dismisses the workers who were already on his payroll. Entering the mansion, we arrive in the central hall, clad in half-height wood paneling with ornately carved knoll posts flanking the bifurcated staircase. In the Moorish room, an eclectic array of architectural elements mixes with antique, international furnishings, all illuminated by lamps and windows designed by Louis Comfort Tiffany. In the dining room, a massive fireplace acts as the visual anchor, with intricate relief work on its mantle. The green room, centered around an onyx fireplace, contained gilded plasterwork with luxurious velvet and lace curtains pulling on the floor, a symbol of excessive wealth. Going upstairs, the second floor stair hall boasted curving banisters, carved wooden balustrade, and pilasters with ionic capitals. Several bedrooms were finished out with the highest quality materials that money could buy, including South African pink marble on the fireplace surrounds. In a time when indoor plumbing was only starting to become accessible in small towns and cities, the mansion boasted several bathrooms, complete with vanities, toilets, and tubs, placed atop marble hexagon tiles and set against porcelain subway wall tiles. Heading up to the third floor, we will find the ballroom, where we can imagine guests in formal attire dancing on the wood floors. Up here we will also find the schoolroom, where the family's governess would have educated the children. After John's passing, the mansion was abandoned and sat empty for over 40 years. Finally, in 1967, it was purchased by a couple with plans to restore the mansion and open it to the public. While restorations continue to be ongoing, they have been successful in opening the mansion for guided tours and hosting a bed and breakfast from its many lavish bedrooms. Did you have a favorite room? Let me know down below in the comment section. And while you're there, make sure to hit the subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House.